Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage The Vault Series. Today's interview was shot back in 2005 with my good friend Charlie McCoy. Charlie is one of the ground zero, if you want to say that, studio musicians here in Nashville as far as being part of the Nashville A-Team. Charlie has played on so many, well, the, the biggest country song of all time, He Stopped Loving Her Today, as well as with Bob Dylan and Elvis and the list is just infinite. I mean, it's just in, impossible to even touch on everything that he's done and still does to this day. Charlie talks about how Nashville developed from a little cottage industry, basically how the doors just flew off the wall when Bob Dylan came and recorded here. and It became extremely in vogue for everybody to come here once Dylan recorded here. He talks about some of the greatest... Uh, A-team studio musicians and the impact that they had on, on Nashville's music as well as, as the impact they had on him as, himself. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Once again, one of the greatest session musicians from harmonica to guitar to, to playing his car keys on the record, Charlie McCoy. Where, where are you from, Charlie? I was born in Oak Hill, West Virginia, which... Uh, it's the same town Hank Williams died in. Now there's some useless trivia for you. <laughs> How were you when you um, first realized that you were gonna be a musician? Well, I got a, I got a harmonica when I was eight years old and uh, from a comic book, 50 cents in a box top. You know, you can play in seven days of your money back. So uh, that was my first instrument was a harmonica. You play other instruments? Yeah, I play. Uh, I started guitar about eight months after that, after I got my first harmonica. And uh, along the way, I've picked up keyboard, bass, uh, vibraphone, sax, trumpet, tuba. What was your first time you performed in front of the public? Uh, I was probably 16. We had a little band. Uh, my uh, guitar teacher formed a band of some of his students, and we played at a home show. And uh, about that time, you know, it was the mid-50s, and rock and roll was starting to happen. And, uh, well, I had a guitar, and I, I realized I could carry a tune, so uh, we got a couple other guys together. Uh, we had a piano player that could play just like Fats, and, and uh, we played at, at a high school uh, just, uh, you know, for a little after-school party. When did you realize you were going to do this full-time? Well, uh, I was in, uh, I, was, I was raised in uh, Florida. We, we moved from West Virginia to Florida, and uh, uh, I was playing in rock and roll bands, and I got a job with a country band playing 15 minutes of rock and roll each hour singing and playing, and uh, one night Mel Tillis came in and heard me, and he, he told me that uh, if I would come to Nashville, he could get me on DECA tomorrow. How old were you then? I was uh, 17. And uh, the guy I was working for, who knew Mel, he said, well, I don't think he can get you on DECA tomorrow, but he is very well connected in Nashville. So uh, when I graduated from high school, uh, the same guy that I was working for drove me to Nashville to audition. And I came up here and auditioned for Chap, Owen, Don Law, and Jim Vino. And uh, what I was doing was uh, singing and playing Chuck Berry. And needless to say, I got turned down by all four of those people. And, uh, but Owen, Owen was really great. He invited me to go to a session. And, of course, I didn't even know what he was talking about. I was, uh, you know, I was like the, when you're 18, you know everything. And uh, I was a pretty big fish in Miami, and, and I thought, what do these people in this little town know? And so I went to this session mainly because, well, I didn't have anything else to do. And uh, I went and I watched Brendan Lee record Sweet Nothings. And... Uh, that was it, B? Yeah. And... When I heard the first playback, my whole life changed. It's the greatest thing I'd ever heard. 
And I decided at that moment, to heck with being a singer, I want to do this. I want to be a studio musician. So I went back to Florida, went one year to the University of Miami, studying music education, and after one year I said, nope, I can't do it. I, I, I re kept remembering what I saw and what I heard, and I said, I gotta figure out a way to do that. So how did you do it? Well, I came back up here to play in a band. A friend of mine from that was originally from Miami was up here, and they put a band together. I came up to play in a band, and uh, uh, Mel Tillis's manager was helping me, Jim Denny. And uh, he started uh, letting me play on demo sessions. And uh, the guy I came up with was letting me help him write songs. It was Kent Westbury. And uh, we wrote a song. I sang the demo. It was a kind of a rock song. And it was, you know, nobody around here was singing that way. So I sang the demo. And uh, uh, in... Uh, September of 60, Jim Denny called me and said, uh, Archie Blyer with Cadence Records has heard your demo and he wants to record you. So here I was singing again. And uh, so Jim Denny uh, said to me, well, I want you to be available anytime Archie wants to see you. So uh, I'm gonna let you play some demo sessions to make a living. So I started playing demo sessions Chet heard my harp on a song that he was going to record. And uh, May of 61, I was called by Chet to come and play on a session with Ann Margaret. No kidding. And that's where it started. For fun, uh, Kenny Buttry and Wayne Moss and me had a little rock and roll band. We would play on the weekends here. And uh, I was playing bass. And so uh, I started uh, playing bass on some sessions. Electric bass. I, I don't. I don't play acoustic bass. Electric bass, and uh, I started uh, being the session leader for Bob Johnston, who came here to write songs for Elvis. Well, one thing led to another. He became a producer, and he brought Bob Dylan to town, and uh, so uh, for my way of thinking, when Bob Dylan came to Nashville the doors here swung wide open. That's what I call the Nashville explosion. After Bob Dylan came, he was followed by Peter, Paul and Mary, Joan Baez, Buffy St. Marie, The Birds, Gino Vanelli, Neil Young, Linda Ronstadt. I mean, but it took Dylan to come here. And we'd always, we'd always recorded a lot of pop records here. People don't remember the pop records that were cut here. I mean, other than Brendan Lee and Roy Orbison and the Everly Brothers. Uh, songs like My Special Angel and Jingle Bell Rock by Bobby Helms. Bobby Helms is as country a singer as there is, but he had these two huge pop hits. Uh, Johnny Horton. Johnny Horton had three or four huge hits. Uh, of course, uh, Perry Como. Perry Como cut hits here. And we even had R&B hits coming out of here. Uh, Joe Simon. Uh, Peggy Scott and JoJo Benson. Brooke Benton recorded here. Uh, so there was always a lot of records recorded here that went pop. But, uh, oh, I, Johnny Tillotson. I can't forget Johnny Tillotson. But uh, after Dylan came, it was a whole other kind of a, a thing then. It was the, you know, the mid-60s was the, what I call the, the Haight-Ashbury era. And uh, pop acts and folk, folk rock. And after Dylan came, then all of those artists started to come here. And then we needed more studios, more musicians. And uh, that's when the, you know, for a while it was like the A team and a few extra guys, but there was too much work. So uh, it opened the door for lots of musicians and lots of writers. and. Everything. You played on, he, he, Dylan cut three albums here? Four. Four albums? Yeah. And you played on all of them, didn't you? I, yeah, I played on actually five albums for Dylan. I played on one in New York, uh, Highway 61 Revisited. And then here he recorded 
blonde on blonde, John Wesley Harding, Nashville Skyline, and then after the fact, uh, he wasn't here, but Kenny Buttry and I went in and did some work on an album called Self Portrait. Yeah. Yeah. Also, Simon and Garfunkel. I played on the boxer with Simon and Garfunkel here. What did you play on that? Bass harmonica. Manhattan Transfer. I mean, it, it was amazing, the artists that came after, uh, after Dylan came. So really, there should be a statue to Bob Dylan in this town, musically, right? I, I don't know. I would, maybe, maybe a combination of, of him and Bob Johnston. I mean, it was Bob Johnston's vision to bring Dylan here. And uh, that, and it took some, I think it took some persuasion. I don't think Dylan was too keen on the idea. But after we did the session in New York and it went so easy, I think that helped Johnston convince him to come here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A similar story, I guess, from Pete Drake and Ringo. Uh, yeah. Because I know he had to convince Ringo to come here. Yep. Yeah, I remember that. I played on that. Uh, he, he did? He did it at Scotty Moore's, the studio Scotty built. Yeah. The album was called Buku of Blues. Right. Buku of Blues. Yeah. It was fun. Ringo was a nice guy. You played on, I know you played on a lot of sessions over with the Billy Sherrill. Yeah, I played on He Stopped Loving Her Today. Uh, played on Rose Garden. Uh, Charlie Rich, Mohair Sam. Uh, a lot of records for for Columbia, uh, and a lot of a lot of records for RCA. Uh, you know, Skeeter Davis, Jim Ed Brown, Dolly, uh, Bobby Bear. I did the tuning guitar on Detroit City. Yeah, yeah. Uh, some uh, some other instruments I've done on records. Uh, I did uh, trumpet on Everybody Must Get Stoned. Uh, Baritone sax on Pretty Woman. Uh, uh, organ on Easy Lovin' by Freddie Hart. Uh, I did a lot of uh, uh, organ and uh, organ uh, with Elvis and uh, did vibes on uh, vibes and bells on Blue Velvet by Bobby Vinton. That was at B, Studio Columbia yeah. B, right? Yeah. Do uh, you remember who produced that? Yeah, a guy named Bob Morgan came came here from New York. Uh, I did uh, bass harmonica on the boxer, uh, bass on John Wesley Harding, Nashville Skyline, and Self Portrait. So you played bass on the original All on the Watchtower. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well. I mean, those were, I, I think those are some of the bigger, harmonica on He Stopped Loving Her Today, which I think may be the best piece of session work I ever did, because it's exactly what I wanted to play. I think it fit the song right, and, you know, it was just enough. Uh, if, if I was going to coach somebody how to play on a session, I, I, I think, of course, I learned from Grady Martin, who I think was the best ever, but I mean, that... That's the way I would coach somebody to do it. Would it be possible to name some of your favorite producers that you work with? Oh, sure. Uh, Owen Bradley, Jerry Kennedy, uh, Billy Sherrill. Uh, I used to love to work for Chet. He rarely ever said a word. Uh, uh, there was, uh, Pete Drake was a great producer. Uh, Oh, and then, of course, Archie Blyer, who gave me my first recording contract, Fred Foster, who gave me my second recording contract, my real successful recording contract. Uh, How many albums did you make yourself? 31. Just released my 31st album. I'll just say, you know, there's so many great players here, but the greatest session player I've ever known, for me, is Pig Robbins. Uh, he's played probably on more sessions, maybe more than anybody else by now. He's played the same chord changes 10,000 times, and it's always interesting, it's always new, it's always different, and when he's on a session, everybody else plays better. 
Uh, I think the best session leader I ever worked with was Grady Martin. Grady was like an interior decorator. He could look at a, he could look at an empty room and, and immediately see the finished result. And if you'll, uh, well, when you played sessions with Grady, 99 times out of 100, the first thing he played was what he played on the record. It's just that he had the vision and he could see it. And, and uh, he taught me more about when not to play than anybody I ever worked with. Um, now th those are probably the, the two biggest influences I have as far as you know, my favorite player and the guy that taught me the most. And the thing about Pig is when you mention Pig's name, most people smile. That know him. Of course. Because he's just such a funny guy. Yep, yep. And, and, and he's always the same. Yep, yep. Truly is. I know that I never did a session I could help without him being yeah. on the session. Yeah, and you know, I mean, he's, I, it's, it was, before everybody started writing charts, it was very commonplace. You'd go in and run a song down, and 10 or 15 minutes later, people were asking him what the chords were. And it's, that was very common because he has this, this memory of his is, is just amazing. It's like a computer. Going back to the Dylan sessions, do you have any memories of those sessions in particular or what it was like, uh, what Dylan yeah. was like? Two, two, two points that uh, the first day we were hired, he also brought with him uh, Robbie Robertson and uh, Al Cooper for the first album, for Bon and Bon. We were hired at two o'clock. His plane was late, he came at six. And when he came in, he said, uh, I haven't finished writing the song yet, you guys wait. And we started recording at 4 a.m. Sad Eyed Lady of the Lowlands, a 14 minute ballad. I'll never forget that. The second thing was uh, on the same album, the producer came to me and said, uh, he wants to do a song with a Salvation Army kind of a, of a sound. Uh, do, can you get a trumpet and a trombone? And I said, well, if you want a, if you want a Salvation Army, the, the trumpet doesn't necessarily need to be too good. He said, right. And I said, okay, I can do that. And I'll get you a trombone player. What time do you need him? And he said, call him in at midnight. So I called uh, Wayne Butler, a great trombone player. And I said, come down to Columbia tonight at midnight. Uh, Wayne showed up about 20 till 12. And about 20 after, he packed up his horn and went home. Record was cut. We did two takes. All of the laughter and the yelling on the song was, was going on there live in the studio. And that was it. Two takes and it was done. A huge record off those sessions was um, Lay Lady Lay. Yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did you play on? You played bass on that? Played one? bass. Kenny Buttry was an amazing drum part on that. There's a, there's a cowbell thing going on, and uh, many people I know swear it had to be overdubbed, but it was not. He played it all at once. I, I sat and watched him. And uh, also on that song, I think uh, Pete Drake had a really great thing that he added on the steel. Any other other memorable sessions that you that comes to the top of your head? That was... It was a, a great Elvis story. Uh, Elvis, they, they were doing all this movie soundtracks here and Elvis, you know, would sleep all day and want to record all night, which made it tough on a lot of us because we were working other sessions during the daytime. I remember several times leaving RCA going and having breakfast and going to my next session. But, uh, so they would bring in uh, food at midnight and one night uh, they brought in, you know, burgers and fries and, and you know, he had those, uh, the, his friends around, they called the Memphis Mafia. Mm -hmm. So they brought this food in and they set it up on a table there at Studio B RCA. And there was a big, uh, like a big cup full of, uh, Pickles uh, Spears, you know, dill pickles. And uh, Jerry Kerrigan was playing drums on that session. And he went over and 
was reaching for a pickle and from out of nowhere this hand came and said, those are Elvis's pickles. And that, that was it. They, and you know, and if, and if it was Elvis, he would have given him the whole, the whole cup, you know, no problem. But <laughs> so these guys, I guess uh, some of them had a need to, you know, to earn their money. <laughs> to earn their money, right. Well, man, I know uh, we're on kind of a tight schedule here and I'm trying to try to keep it within the... Yeah, well, uh, just let me wrap it up and, and say that, uh, number one, I, to get to do what I've done is, was a dream. It, you know, it was a dream I had from the day I watched Brendan Lee record Sweet Nothings. To actually get to do it was unbelievable. To still be doing it 40 years later is just mind-boggling to me. Uh, you know, I have, the, I have played with some of the best musicians in the world here. And, uh, and I'm, as proud of, I'm as proud of a lot of the records that nobody ever heard as I am the big, you know, because people are always, they're impressed by the stars you've played with. But I, I'm impressed by people that have talent and people that are good people and, you know, that really want to do this. I, I, I'm impressed by that, whether they're stars or not. And uh, uh, to get to do this for 45 years is, is an absolute dream come true. And uh, I think that the thing that impresses me the most about Nashville is that you can get a, you can get a group of studio musicians and go have a session with a guy who just who, who hawked his farm in Kansas to get enough money to come here. And for that three hours, that guy is as important to those musicians as Garth Brooks or Elvis or Bob Dylan. And I think that's the key to Nashville's success.